This is Postscript, an in-depth follow-up to the sermons you hear each week at FaithBridge. We sit down with the speaker for behind-the-scenes insight on sermon preparation and more in-depth insights and discussion. Let's join in now. Hi, I'm Christy Sprague. Welcome to Postscript. I'm sitting here with Ben Stewart, who's just uh, started a new series with us, taking us through the book of Exodus. Uh, one of our favorite Bible teachers here today. Thanks for being here today, sure. Ben. Um, great message today, and we had um, some pretty good questions come in. A couple related to scripture and a couple related more to overarching ideas sure. that you presented. Mm -hmm. um, so let me begin with the first one. Um, you're really talking about the human condition today. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the story of the Pharaoh um, oppressing uh, the people of Israel, we really see this story played out over and over throughout history where yeah. a leader comes into power, he feels threatened by a certain group of people, he oppresses them or attacks them. Um, you even referenced some headlines in CNN where that's being played out, maybe even on smaller stages, over and over and over. Mm -hmm. So in the idea of I have my own individual story that's joined into this bigger story, mm -hmm. how does my little story join into that bigger story in a way that affects change in our, in our culture, in our history with these things? Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Yeah, I mean... Man, we could talk about this for days in terms of all the institutional sin and governmental structures. And I mean, uh, maybe in a real simplistic way, I, I would say when you look at sin, any sin, be it a, a king or you mm -hmm. in your house one day, whatever, um, <clears throat> what does God ultimately do with that? It's either going to be met with law or grace, right? You know, like... Uh, I'm either going to pay the penalty of my sin upon myself or God is going to graciously forgive me because of what Christ did, right? And so what I'm praying in my own life is that as I submit to God, his grace covers sin, heals, restores, changes me, makes me more like him. And I'm praying that over other people as well. So an example would be like an Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, because of his religious convictions, was killing people mm -hmm. and was part of a an institution in power that was murdering Christians in the first century. And so you go, what do I want to happen to a Paul? Well, I either want God to smite him and kill him, right? Mm -hmm. Or I want God to radically forgive and rescue and redeem him and make him an agent of peace, right? right. And God did that with Paul. Much of our New Testament was written by Paul. Mm -hmm. So God takes a murderous employee of this institution with power and makes them an object of grace, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So God's doing that all the time. Now, will we always have sinful people on this world? Yeah. In little ways and sinful kings, sin will hit every strata of society and God will punish some, uh, but he is slow in it because he would love to make them emblems mm -hmm. of grace. And so, you know, when I see terrorists, I mean, I pray for those men that God would convict them of their sin and repent. But I know if he doesn't run into grace, they'll run into judgment mm -hmm. eternally from God. And then in the world, I want the church to reach out to people and bring them grace. But if they persist in those governmental structures, murdering people, killing people, then they'll meet the arm of the state, which the New Testament says God has not given the state the sword for nothing. So God even says at a human level, mm -hmm. you're going to run into grace or law, which is it going to be, you know? Yeah. So... Uh, now, for us, in my own life, I want to be quick to confess sin, repent. I want to pray for that to happen in other people's lives. That's a way to be a part of it. And then when I go out into the world, uh, I want to be an agent of the gospel and see the gospel transform lives. Mm -hmm. And that can be your neighbor. It can be a principal. It can be a CEO. It can be a, a king. Who knows who God will put you in front of. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I think also that we have to um, maybe see it with different eyes. Um, yeah. Just as you talked about the difference between adventure and security, mm -hmm. we long to be part of adventure, to have a purpose. Um, yeah. But at the same time, we spend our entire lives surrounding ourselves with things that give us more security and more comfort. Yeah. So, you know, if we want to 
make a change there, I think maybe we have to see it differently because let's face it, my life is not going to turn into the Hunger Games tomorrow. Right. So that's not the adventure that I'm going to be a part of. Right. But how do I begin to see what, do I, how do I look at it differently um, for God to show me what my adventure is? Yeah. You know? Well, I think, again, for us, it's going to be what do you make your source? I mean, your source of security, your source of meaning and value, if it's your little life of, I don't need millions of dollars, but I just need everything I want, God, and I just want to grip on to these things. Uh, the crazy thing about that is, you know, Jesus said it, if you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you mm-hmm. save it. We're like people that just grip tightly to the Titanic because steel is more sturdy than rubber life rafts. And you're like, yeah, but that steel is sinking. Right. Like, let go. This is actually way more secure. And we can see God is insecure. So for me, like, and you're, you're going to wake up tomorrow and go, yeah, how do I live the great adventure as, uh, you know, uh, mom, employee, student? How do I do that? For me, I go, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wake up and say, where I am on the planet doesn't really matter that much. It's what am I making my source of comfort and security and meaning? It's going to be the Lord. As much as I can and perfectly as I can, I'm going to say, God, what do you want for my life? What are you about today? What do you care about? Let me care about those things. What do you think about? Let me think about those things. And what I find is as I'm someone who's thinking the thoughts of God after him as I read his word, Mm -hmm. asking him to shape my heart to feel what he feels, Mm -hmm. then when I walk into the grocery store, I see everybody differently. Mm. You see what I mean? And then when I walk into my office building, I see them very differently, you know? And uh, so the guy I mentioned at that uh, oil company I work Mm -hmm. for, there was a woman that worked there that was always making fun of him for his religious convictions, constantly badgering him and, and, and mocking him in front of people. And if his whole thing is just his own pride and ego, you'd be like, well, you know what? Forget you. I don't need this. I don't need this kind of abuse. You know what I mean? It could, it could be real defensive. Mm-hmm. He was a man focused on Jesus and his responses were so Christ-like. He was gracious to her. And when she was really coming after him, he would walk up and just give her a hug. She was mm-hmm. like this little old lady. He would be like, I just love you and hug her. And, and what happened was she got sick and he would take care of her. And by the end of it, she loved him because she knew this guy, I deserve nothing from this man but dismissal. Mm -hmm. And his family continues to care for me. And you go, he is changing her life and her family's life. He's becoming this culture shifting man. Because when he walks into that office, yeah, he's thinking about oil, but he's thinking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so he's changing the culture. So I could go on, it was amazing. That's how we do it, is we change our immediate little world around How do I see it? Right. Yeah. How do I enter it? Well, you mentioned that um, the midwives were culture shapers, and that's why we know their names um, here in the book of Exodus. And we had a question that actually came in um, about those midwives. Uh, It says, how do you explain that in Exodus 119, the midwives lie to Pharaoh about not killing the male babies, but yet they are rewarded by God for their lie in Exodus 120? Yeah. Um, That's a great question. I mean, it's interesting to see commentators kind of try to figure out how to solve that. I mean, some that I've read go to great lengths to say they didn't necessarily lie. Like there's nothing about what they're saying that you go, well, they were, it doesn't tell you. And they lied and said X, you know, Um, Hebrew women were quite possibly more vigorous Mm -hmm. than Egyptian women. You think in terms of they lived a hard life, they were harder people. They lived as soft life, softer people. So that probably could have been true, just not the whole truth Mm -hmm. is one potential issue. Does that make it okay? I don't know. But you could technically say they didn't lie. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is God seems comfortable with their value system, that they value life. And however imperfectly they did it, I don't think Mm -hmm. you see God saying, hey, lying is amazing. But I think God looks and says they valued life and I'm going to bless them for that. Mm -hmm. So you think of what God has to work with. He's working with sinners all the time. 
And so does that mean he vouches for and approves of and celebrates our sin? Not necessarily, but he think, I think he sees them valuing life and mm-hmm. he blesses that. Could they have done it a different way? Possibly. Is God okay with them lying because the ends justify the means? You could take that argument way too far. I think he obviously feels some comfort level of going, I value life mm-hmm. in this moment more mm-hmm. than I value this. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I'll leave the rest to philosophers uh, for that. But <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's my short answer. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, let's look at another verse um, in uh, Exodus 2, verse 25. Um, the last one that you read said, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. And it just ends like that. The, the, the yeah. chapter ends right there. So is this pointing towards something? Um, what does this mean? Am, am, am I supposed to find hope in the fact yeah. that God knew that they were suffering and I'm suffering, but yet nothing's yeah. really happened to change that yet? Yeah. I mean, we, we have, uh, those words in English don't really convey what's happening. Okay. Um, you know, um, the word no in Hebrew is a very intimate personal word. It's a relational connectivity word, you know? So um, Adam knew his wife Eve and they brought forth a son, Mm -hmm. you know? That doesn't mean knowing means sexual intercourse. It means knowing means deep communing and intimacy. And that's what God promised his people in Genesis, that my covenant people, you're my covenant people, like a husband and wife. And I know you, I know every part of you. And that, what that means is I'm connected to you. I'm part of you. So it is a comforting thing. Cause it's not like, yeah, I'm, I'm aware that there's currently suffering happening in Egypt. Like we tend to just make it cognitive and that's not what this is talking about. Um, this is saying they're crying out in oppression and they're wondering, does God care? And God's saying, I see you. I'm not dismissive. I'm not indifferent. Mm -hmm. I see you and I care. And so what you see is God tells them initially, I am deeply connected personally, emotionally, and what's happening to you. I care. And then what you see, and you see it in chapter two, and we didn't get into much of it. And then you see it explode in chapter three. God says, I see, I care. So I have come down. Mm -hmm. Chapter three, because for him, compassion moves him to action. And so, yeah, it's a way of saying, now you've got me involved. And, uh, and so, yeah, you're supposed to hear the bass roll behind that of something's about to go down. Okay. You know? Yeah. Is that where you're going to take us maybe next week? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, right? (laughs) Right. Um, well, thanks for being here today and just talking through some of these things. I'm sure we'll have some more great questions for you next week. Yeah. Great. All right. Cool. And thank you for being here as well. We hope that you will join us next week for another Postscript. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us for another Postscript. We hope this resource will help to enrich your small group discussions this week. If you're not currently a part of the life-changing community found in a small group, you're missing out on one of the best things about Faith Bridge. Visit us and learn more at the Connection Center on Sunday or anytime at faithbridge.org groups. Also, we'd love to get your feedback about this podcast. Send us an email to postscript at faithbridge.org. We'll be back next week with a brand new postscript. Until then, have a great week.